Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for tonight's program. My name is Liz Schultz and I am the director at the Oberlin Heritage Center. We are a local historical society here in town and our mission is to preserve and share Oberlin's unique heritage and to make our community a better place to live, learn, work and visit. So it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Randall Roberts, who will be talking with us about the Buckeye Trail he is a Buckeye Trail Association trustee and also chair of his local chapter. I first became of his interest when we were hosting a program about legendary hiker Grandma Gatewood. Uh, you may also recognize Mr. Roberts around town as the city engineer of Oberlin. He is from Cleveland and is now a resident of Strongsville. He is a veteran of the United States Navy Civil Engineer Corps where he served 12 years on active duty and nine years in the Navy reserves, including one deployment to Iraq. He has hiked the entire Buckeye Trail over several years, which he will talk more about, as well as hiked several pieces of other prominent trails. I figure many of you joining us tonight are enthusiasts of all trails and hiking opportunities. And here's a little forewarning that this program will give you the travel bug. <laughs> Sure, he will mention it, but I also want to encourage you to check on the Buckeye Trails website after the program to learn more about how you can be involved and supportive. So without further ado, here is Mr. Randall Roberts. Thank you for volunteering to do this program. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I do want to thank the Oakland Heritage Center for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, a passion of mine and something I love and I definitely like to share the Buckeye Trail, uh, most people in Ohio have not heard of it. Uh, when I run into people and they find out I'm hiking the Buckeye Trail and they tell me they've never heard of it, I always fall back on my canned line. Well, that's because it's new. It's only been around since 1959. Uh, thank you for, again for the opportunity. I will tell you uh, this presentation will be kind of an introduction to the Buckeye Trail. I wanna tell you the history of the trail, kind of how it evolved give you a few tips on how to hike the trail and where to get re some resources. I want to tell you about the Buckeye Trail Association, our mission and our goal, how you can support us or get involved, and um, tell you some techniques on, on different styles on hiking the trail. I'm not going to go into any kind of detail about backpacking, so it's, this is not about uh, base weights or how to filter water, etc. And I'm not going to talk uh, specifically about my hike on the trail other than uh, give you my experience as I talk about the trail itself. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. And hopefully everyone can see my uh, first slide. Yep. Uh, which would be um, a barn, which is... Uh, uh, hike the Buckeye Trail. It's kind of funny that that started showing up on some of our media and I had hiked the entire trail at that point and never seen that barn. Uh, but at the time it was painted, it was not on the trail yet. And they, they relocated the Buckeye Trail. And when I went back to hike that new section, I finally saw the barn and went, okay, I wasn't blind or oblivious that it just wasn't on the trail quite yet. A Buckeye Trail enthusiast in that area um, did that. So as Liz said, I did uh, start hiking the Buckeye Trail in 2008 and I did finish. Okay, I'm trying to figure out why my slide's not advancing here. There we go. I, I did finish on May 20th in 2017. I finished at Finley State Park. Uh, one of the things when I started doing is uh, I started ki kind of in the Cuyahoga Valley and I was going east and when a friend started hiking with me, I would go west so he could pick up where um, he left off. Well, other way around, when he hiked with me, I went east. When he couldn't, I hiked west and I started thinking about where am I going to finish the trail. And when I got to Finley State Park, I thought this would be a perfect place to finish uh, with a potluck picnic, uh, reserve the group campsite for people to come out and hike. And about 25 people joined me on my final hike. And that day was exactly like I pictured it in the eight hours, eight years of hiking the trail, except I always thought the ribbon would be blue. Other than that, I had a really good time. Uh, so the Buckeye Trail Association is a nonprofit organization. Uh, our purpose is to build, maintain, protect, and promote 
uh, the Buckeye Trail. And I got this slide in here to remind myself not to talk too much about Grandma Gatewood. Uh, you should know that in 1955, she was the first woman to solo through hike the Appalachian Trail at age 67. There was another woman who through hiked the AT before uh, Emma Gatewood, but she had a, a companion. And so Emma is the first solo through hiker. Some people will erroneously say she's the first woman to finish, but she is the first woman to hike it by herself. Uh, and the reason the slide is in here is to tell you that there is a wonderful book, Grandma Gatewood's Walk by Ben Montgomery. I had the pleasure of meeting him. He's a really nice guy. And this is a, a really nice book about uh, Grandma Gatewood's uh, walk on the AT and her life as well. There is a wonderful documentary uh, produced in Ohio by Eden Valley Enterprises uh, called Trail Magic, the Grandma Gatewood story. Uh, this documentary actually talks more about uh, Emma Gatewood's life. Uh, she was an abused wife, and that probably led to some of the reasons she went off to hike the, uh, the AT. Wonderful documentary. Uh, you can find it in the library, or you can go to EdenValleyEnterprises.org and either download it or uh, order the DVD. I encourage you to look, uh, learn more about Emma Gatewood if you've not heard of her. So in 1958, there was an article published in the Columbus Dispatch, and the article was called A Buckeye Trail. So far, it's just an idea. And it was written by an ODNR employee, but he wrote it under a, a pseudonym. And I believe it was because he didn't want to confuse that this was an actual uh, ODNR initiative. This was his idea. Some others shared his idea. And in 1959, those people came together, incorporated, and created the Buckeye Trail Association. That article uh, provided some great detail on where the trail was going to go. And the concept was to start in Cincinnati along uh, the Ohio River and work its way up to uh, the southeast and, and eastern part of the state uh, to the northern terminus, which would have been Lake Erie. It, the plan was to visit some state parks and nature preserves along the way, and they had that pretty well detailed. And in 1960, uh, the BTA actually started Blazing Trail. The picture up in the upper left is actually Emma Gatewood supervising uh, the blazing of the trail, which would have been uh, near the Old Man's Cave section. And Emma Gatewood became one of the first founding members and trustee for the Buckeye Trail Association. So I love it when I sign my name as a Buckeye Trail Association trustee, and I feel like I'm signing just like Emma Gatewood did. So in the 60s, uh, the trail started going through some changes as, uh, as volunteers were blazing and figuring out where the best place to locate the trail was. There was the little loop in the Northeast section was actually part of the original trail. Uh, there was kind of two camps. One wanted to go through the Cuyahoga Valley, uh, which was not a, a national park yet, and up through some of the uh, metro parks. And other members of the board wanted to head east a little bit to go through the reserves and or the reservoirs and some of the state parks. So I actually like the map that's depicted in 1969 uh, on the left because uh, that loop on the 1970 map, I don't know that that was ever uh, an actual route for the trail or just a consideration. Today, that is not part of our trail, but the original trail from the 1969 map is kind of what we have today. Except in 1970, uh, there was a study for a potential North Country National Scenic Trail. So that went through uh, some evolutionary uh, studies to, to look at feasibility and they identified a corridor for the North Country National Scenic Trail. And the idea was when it came in from Pennsylvania, it would join the Buckeye Trail and then head north along the Miami Erie Canal Corridor. Uh, it takes kind of an act of Congress for a National Scenic Trail, but in 1970, the Buckeye Trail Association started blazing that trail anyway because as one of the notes in one of the uh, meeting minutes says, that's what we do. So in 1978, 
we were almost completing the trail. We marked uh, pretty much what the North Country Trail would go, but then it was decided, you know, for a few hundred extra miles, we can complete the loop. And in 1980, that loop was completed uh, near Deerlick Cave and the Brexville Reservation. And that picture, I believe, was taken March of 1981 to commemorate the closing of what uh, some of us call the Big Loop. And also in 1980, the North Country National Scenic Trail did become an official scenic trail. In 1993, the American Discovery Trail, uh, which goes from Delaware to San Francisco or California, uh, became a, a, a coast to coast trail. Most of that follows roads, uh, but it visits very unique places. And it joins us uh, in Southern Ohio as well. And I have a map to show you the, the linkages of that. In 1999, uh, the Buckeye Trail was designated Ohio's Millennium uh, Hiking Trail. And if not for this slide, I'm not sure we would remember that. Uh, just kind of a, a point in history and a, kind of a curious fact about the B, BT. In 2010, we hired our first paid executive director. Uh, prior to that, it was a volunteer position. Uh, we acquired a lease of a century old barn at Tappan Lake, eventually leasing the property itself and eventually purchasing or being gifted the property. So the BTA owns property and this barn at uh, Tappan Lake and we hold our annual morale fest there and we hold our uh, board member retreat there and we have some other encampments uh, throughout the year. So this slide, I'm, I'm showing the trails um, on the right. You can see the, the blue is the Buckeye Trail. The gold is the North Country Trail. And that trail goes from uh, the AT in Vermont all the way out to where the Lewis and Clark Trail is in North Dakota. That's about 4,700 miles long. And uh, you can see that map on, on your left. The American Discovery Trail uh, goes from Delaware to California and it joins us, uh, crosses over into Ohio at Parkersburg, uh, into Belpre, Ohio. It's about a 40 mile uh, until it hits the Buckeye Trail, follows the Buckeye Trail all the way to Eden Park in Cincinnati. It goes across the river into Kentucky for about eight miles and then takes a ferry back across the, the river and then up to Elizabethtown where it branches off into that north and uh, south routes. And I'm proud to say that I've hiked all of the Ohio portions that you can see on this map. Once I finished the Buckeye Trail, it wasn't too much to add the North Country Trail by hiking from Zor to Pennsylvania and then Napoleon up to uh, into Michigan. And then once I did that to finish uh, the two pieces of the American Discovery Trail that I yet to, the, that I hadn't hiked at that point. I love hiking, uh, leading hikes down in Southern Ohio, uh, because I'll tell people that we're going to hike 30 miles today. We're going to hike 10 miles on the Buckeye Trail, 10 miles on the North Country Trail, and 10 miles on the American Discovery Trail. We're just going to be very efficient about it. So today the, the Buckeye Trail is over 1400 miles long. Uh, we use the 1444 is a number that's often put out there, but honestly, the, the trail is kind of always changing. Uh, we try to move more and more from road walk to off-road each year. Uh, we are the longest loop trail in the nation. Uh, we've said that and no one has argued with us, so we're pretty sure that uh, it's true. Uh, we go through 48 of the 88 counties in Ohio. It's broken up into 26 sections, and you can see on the map that they're, they're labeled. Uh, the reason for breaking up into sections is mostly for mapping and maintenance and supervision for the maintenance. Uh, we log about 15,000 volunteer hours each year. As I said, the Buckeye Trail Association is a 501c3. We do have uh, a couple of uh, dedicated full-time staff. We have some part-time staff. And we also use AmeriCorps volunteers uh, that are getting paid for uh, their services. So to tell you about the Buckeye Trail, I've chosen to use uh, the book, Follow the Blue 
Blazes. It's written by uh, Connie Pond and her husband, Robert Pond. Uh, I'm going to use this book to uh, guide you and, and explain uh, where the trail goes. Uh, in this book, uh, each section is are broken into chapters, and each chapter has a uh, has three feature hikes uh, laid out for different mileages and, and with some alternates. It gives you kind of the history and culture of the area of each section. And as I said, um, features those three hikes. But I'm gonna start with chapter eight, uh, which is the area closest to Oberlin. Um, the trail goes from Fremont to Finley State Park, passing through Clyde, Bellevue, Monroeville, and Wakeman. Uh, from Finley State Park, the trail takes roads to Medina, Hinkley Reservation, through Whips Ledges, onto Richfield Heritage Preserve, which used to be a Crow High Lake, a Girl Scout camp. Chapter nine is the western part of the Little Loop. This section travels through the Cuyahoga Valley National Park and along the Ohio and Erie Canal. There are a number of hikes routes routinely used by several hiking clubs that utilize the Buckeye Trail the bridle trails and the towpath to create some interesting loops. Chapter 10 covers the Eastern side of the Little Loop. I should say the Little Loop is 257 miles long. So it's not so little, but compared to the big loop it is. This section in addition to connecting the original Northern Terminus also joins the Lake Metro Parks Greenway Corridor, Girdled Road Reservation, the Maple Highlands Trail, it passes through Chardon, Headwaters Park, and Burton. It joins the Headwaters Trail into Manaway. Chapter 11 is what the authors call Lake Country. Passing through Massillon, the trail joins the North Country Trail in Zor. The first lake one encounters is Tappan Lake. That's where the BTR barn is and home of our annual Morel Fest. Other lakes along the trail are Clendenning, Piedmont, Salt Fork, and Seneca. These are all man-made lakes uh, for flood control and recreation. It's one of the parts of Ohio that I discovered because I was hiking the Buckeye Trail. I'd seen them on the lake on the map, but until you actually see them in person, uh, you don't realize what a gem they are to recreation and opportunities for fishing and kayaking, swimming and boating and hiking. Chapter 12 is Hill Country. We have the Wilderness Loop. Um, it starts in Bell Valley, Valley, passes Caldwell Lake, follows back roads, often on ridges, arriving in the Wayne National Forest, where free primitive camping can be found, and Lamping Homestead and Ring Mill. Dispersed camping is also allowed in the Wayne. The section includes camping at the former AEP recreation lands, a 60,000 acre outdoor recreation area built on land, one strip mine for its rich coal deposits. Now it's uh, at least part of it is Jesse Owens State Park. The trail passes through Stockport and then to Chester Hill where the American Discovery Trail joins. The trail passes through Burr Oak State Park and continues to Tecumseh Lake in Shawnee, Ohio where the home office of the BTA is located. So starting in the starting where the, the authors start uh, describing the loop in chapter two, chapter one is kind of an introduction and background to the Buckeye Trail. But chapter two is the Southern Wonderland is the term used to describe the beauty of Hocking Hills area. If you haven't been there, I, I encourage you to go. Um, this section begins at Lake Logan, continues to Old Man's Cave, Cedar Falls, Ash Cave, on to Tar Hollow State Park, and finally into Scioto Trail State Forest. Chapter three uh, covers, this is what the authors are calling the Bluegrass Region. It features Pike Lake, Fort Hill State Memorial, the Serpent Mounds, the town of Peebles, and Davis Memorial State Park. Chapter four describes a section of trail near the Ohio River. This portion goes through Shawnee State Park, past a counterfeit house where signals were used to notify boats on the Ohio River when a new batch of fake bills and coins were ready. And this is one of the historical notes on the maps 
that if you walk by this house, you would not know. And I understand it's actually now scheduled for demolition. Uh, the trail continues into East Fork State Park, Williamsburg, and finally Milford. The Little Miami River Valley uh, is in southern, where our southern terminus is at Eden Park in Cincinnati. The trail begins on sidewalks through C Cincinnati, eventually joining the Little Miami Scenic Trail, which it then follows to Yellow Springs via Milford, Loveland, South Lebanon, and Xenia, making a detour into Caesar Creek State Park. This part of the trail traverses Dayton, Troy, Piqua, Fort Loramie, New Brennan, St. Mary's. You might find it oddly named boats to trains, bicycles to planes, but the trail follows the train routes that follow the canal routes, which follow the rivers. You'll pass Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and a Wright Memorial. You'll also pass the Bicycle Museum of America. I don't know how many of you know that that uh, I believe that's a new Brennan that we actually have the Bicycle Museum of America right here in Ohio. And chapter seven is the Great Black Swamp. Uh, what once was a swamp 30 to 40 miles wide was drained to create very fertile land. A good portion of the trail follows the Manaway River. The North Country Trail leaves the Buckeye Trail just east of Napoleon, where it heads into Michigan. It goes into Oak Openings and then joins the Wabash Cannonball Trail. The Buckeye Trail then joins the North Coast Inland Trail into Lamore and continues to Fremont, completing the loop as I described. So that was a quick walk around the Buckeye Trail. Uh, can talk about some hip, uh, tips on hiking the Buckeye Trail. So first of all, why would you wanna hike the Buckeye Trail? Well, you get to see Ohio's beauty. Uh, the beaches of Lake Erie, waterfalls in the Cuyahoga Valley, lakes in the Muskingum water, watershed, splendid beauty of Hocking Hills, the foothills of Appalachia, banks of the Ohio River, nature preserves, state parks, scenic rivers, and that's just some examples of what you find. You also learn uh, Ohio's history, the hunting grounds of the Hopewell, sites of Revolutionary War forts, the War of 1812 skirmishes, canals and locks, the first Mormon temple, uh, three sites of, uh, or at least one of the three sites where the Shenandoah crashed, which was a Navy dirigible, uh, ghost towns of old coal mining towns, John Glenn and many other memorials and much more. And if you're like me, you'll discover parts of Ohio you never even knew existed. So quick tip on how to hike the Buckeye Trail. Well, it's blazed with blazes that are blue and they're two inches wide by six inches high, located on trees or poles, rocks or fence posts at times. Uh, our standard color is Sherwin-Williams sweeping blue. And when I've given this presentation live, uh, I said that and I heard lots of laughter and I was wondering why people were laughing. And then I realized the first time I heard that the official color was sweeping blue that I kind of chuckled myself, but it made me think about why is color important? Well, if you see this, and there's a backstory of this blaze, but you see this, it's no longer two inches by six inches, but as a Buckeye Trail hiker, we'll recognize that shade of blue and give us the confidence that we're still on the trail. It's also important because we join so many other trails through the state, you know, through state parks. Burr Oak State Park, for instance, is blazed with uh, green for the Bobcat Marathon. The uh, white blazes are for the backpack or side loops. Uh, yellow blazes are for the backpack trail and red blazes are for the, um, the bridle path. So uh, we've got their standard blue throughout the state and it's very consistent. Or if you even saw this, you can barely tell that there's a blaze on that tree. But uh, if you're hiking the trail and, and you recognize that sweeping blue. So these blazes are actually legacy blazes. They're located on the towpath uh, in, in around Summit Metro Park. Summit Metro Parks is one of the uh, land managers that 
do not allow us to blaze the trees. So these were done before that rule was put in, for in place and that's why uh, they've been just kind of left to fade. So a single blaze means the trail is uh, fairly straightforward or obvious. It doesn't mean this trail is straight because you know through the woods it's gonna meander. It just means that there's no sharp turns uh, away from the trail and it's kind of obvious. And you should be able to see one blaze uh, to the next. A double blaze is offset in a turn. So uh, the top blaze is the direction of the turn. So if you wanna test yourself that turn blaze right there is a right turn. Uh, this is standard blazing on most long distance trails. And a double blaze, uh, which is not used too often, uh, simply means it's one on top of the other. It simply means the trail may not be obvious. So we might use that where there might be a crossing into a field where there's no blazes on the trees. And so we wanna uh, say, hey, uh, it, it's going to be tricky through here. Sometimes used on switchbacks as well. Sometimes used where you're following a well-developed trail like a gravel trail and uh, for a park and the Buckeye Trail actually turns off or actually goes straight into the woods. It's not a turn, it's a straight, but uh, if you're following that gravel trail, you might turn inadvertently if it wasn't marked for a, a, an alert blaze. The trail may also be marked with carcinite markers. Uh, like I said, we can put those in areas where uh, we don't want to paint the, or we're not allowed to blaze the trees, or we might have those in fields uh, where there is nothing to blaze. And the benefit of those are also to identify that it is the Buckeye Trail, and we can provide some other information on there. The one on the left is also uh, with the North Country National Trail as well. We can um, use those to designate when the trails are closed to motor vehicles. And as I said, some of the park managers like uh, the Summit Metro Parks do not allow blazing of the trees. Uh, at first, when I hiked through there, that was kind of a, uh, a pain because our map kind of read, uh, follow the deer trail to the salamander trail to, and you know, had, each time you came to a trail junction, you had to figure out which one was. But uh, lately, uh, in the last decade, so they, they've done a really nice job of using these arrowheads, and they actually have a BT logo in the arrowhead at trail junctures, and the arrowhead would be uh, oriented in the direction of the trail. So either uh, straight up to go uh, straight or turn to the right or left if you were turning. So even though we're not allowed to blaze the trees, the trail is still well marked through the Summit Metro Parks. So maps, uh, I mentioned earlier that we're divided into 26 sections and each one is its own name for a feature or a town. And each section has its own unique experience. One thing I liked about hiking the Buckeye Trail is it is a variety of trails. Uh, no part is the same. You uh, do not get bored of doing the same thing each time, each place. Each section covers about 46 to 65 miles. Each section has its own map. So the maps are printed in color on fan folded water stock. Uh, they contain all the trail information, directions, uh, known campsites and other facilities. They give you the mileage between landmarks, uh, which is great for planning and uh, your hikes plan. Uh, road streams, geological, biological, topographical information, uh, historic information, which is one of the things I alluded to earlier and one of my favorite things. Some hikers think our trail is, uh, our trail maps are too wordy. Uh, they just want to hike the trail and get the miles in. Uh, for myself, I'm glad to see the history of it. I think the most recent comprom compromise is that those historical notes are shaded in blue. So if you're reading the map and you're just looking for navigation, you know that uh, you can skip over those. They also give emergency phone numbers. And I know with uh, the internet, it's easy to look those up, but it's also nice and convenient to have those on the map ready to go. Uh, and I would, when I went on my hikes, I would leave those emergency numbers uh, with my wife before I left. Luckily, she never had to use them. Maps are updated periodically. I say usually every five years, but it really depends. Some sections stay the same uh, for a long time and other sections 
are a lot more dynamic because as I mentioned earlier, we try to move from road to off road. Uh, we can get, um, we can lose rights uh, from lands that we cover and opportunities open up. So it, it kind of depends on the section, how quickly or often they're updated. We do provide trail alerts on our website. So even though the maps might not be up to date, uh, you can go to our website and look for trail alerts, which might be a temporary closure or a map update, which would be a permanent uh, relocation. Uh, you can purchase them online at our buckeyetrail.org store uh, and they're $8.10 for members. And I believe there's a 10% discount or non-members are 810 and a 10% discount for members. And they're a key source of revenue for the, our association. Here's what a map looks like. I, I know you, you're not gonna be able to read that, but I just wanted to point out that we have turn by turn directions. Uh, there's point numbers on the map, which would be uh, key waypoints, maybe intersections or park entrances, et cetera. Uh, and then on the map, you might be able to see where we've got solid is off road and where it's dotted means it's on road. And a word of caution, off road could be sidewalk or paved uh, bike path because uh, technically those are off road and some of the off road sections could be gravel or dirt roads. We also have electronic mapping. Um, this was released in 2019. Originally it was called the gut hook guides or Atlas Guides, um, and it's now called Far Out. You can get the entire trail for $40 or you can get portions of the trail. The benefit of this is that it works with the GPS on your phone and tablet. So you can pull up your exact location and see if you are off the trail or on the trail. You can also uh, look for the, the closest campgrounds. You can leave public comments or leave notes for yourself. And then other people can read those public comments that are attached to a waypoint. Uh, this is what a lot of the younger generations are using to hike the long distance trails these days. We also have uh, Avenza maps, which are electronic uh, PDFs that uh, work kind of the same way. They work with your phone GPS, but it is a PDF of a map. Um, so whatever we details we put on the map is, is what you're going to see. And they also can pull up your location to see if you are on that map. Uh, generally, I would recommend either having the, the paper maps as a backup to the electronic. And I kind of like using the paper maps for actual uh, directions because uh, I can read those a little easier. The electronic, the gut, the far out guide, we're getting a little better by including the turn by turn. So that product is actually improving as we go. We also have a data book. Uh, so a lot of long distance hikers are familiar with data books. Uh, it's 160 pages of information. It also has a turn by turn navigation. It's watered down from our maps. It doesn't include the history uh, other than the initial chapter. So it's kind of a condensed as far as that goes but some other notes about the trail might not be included, but uh, the kind of a sterile um, distance and turns and, and location also gives the map. So the nice thing about this is it covers all 26 sections of the trail. So you don't have to have 26 section maps. We have uh, eight current chapters and there's two chapters that we're looking to develop. The, the red area in the Northwest uh, does not have a chapter yet. And that brown area in the South Central, uh, we're looking to create a chapter there. The Lake Plains chapter is the chapter for this area. Uh, it covers three sections, Pemberville, Norwalk, and Medina. And the mission of the chapter is to carry out the Buckeye Trail Association's member uh, mission on a local level. Uh, we have hikes and events that we use, that we post on Meetup uh, and membership of the Buckeye Trail Association is not required to join us on the, the hikes, but highly encouraged. We figure if we can get you out there, we'll talk to you about getting an annual membership later. 
Uh, and if you want to join the Lake Plains chapter, they have a hike at Finley State Park on February 5th at 10 a.m. Uh, that's being published and elsewhere as well. Uh, and that is in conjunction with the Friends of the Finley State Park. So I mentioned road walks. A lot of people don't want to hike the Buckeye Trail because we're about 45% road. We're trying to improve that. Some people don't want to hike the roads because of traffic. You can tell in these pictures that we're not worried about traffic. Some people don't want to hike the roads because they're paved. A lot of our roads, especially in Southeast Ohio, are not paved. And some of these roads, to me, are just as valuable and just as enjoyable as hiking a trail. Uh, I enjoy going through the homesteads, for instance. Uh, some of the roads are busy. The ones that are busy, uh, we're not on for very long. Sometimes we need to because we're connecting from place to place. But I, I wanted to show those pictures of the roads because um, some people, until you hike them, uh, you, you don't realize that they, they're, they're not too bad. Here's another benefit of road walk. Um, I don't think that other trail out east will have an ice cream truck pull up behind you. This is my friend Dale. He and I were hiking uh, somewhere in Northeast Ohio and we hear a little brown jug coming up behind us and we both looked at each other and we got out our wallets. It was ironic because this road had no houses on it. So I'm sure this guy didn't expect to make a sale on that road, but he found a couple hot uh, hikers willing to uh, cough up a couple bucks for some ice cream. So hiking styles, uh, you can go on selected hikes. And if you do that, uh, I recommend just getting the follow blue blazes and pick out some hikes that uh, that you know if, appeal to you and and figure out what distance you want to hike and, and go hike the pretty parts, if you will, of the Buckeye Trail. Uh, chapter events, as I mentioned, we have uh, our chapters and the chapters will post group hikes. Uh, sometimes these are out and back hikes or going through key featured areas. And if you don't like a lot of planning, some people like these because you just, you know, show up. Section hike or circuit hike, basically that is like uh, picking up where you left off and hiking uh, a little bit at a time. Or if you, you want to do a weekend or a long weekend or a week at a time, that's fine. Most people that hike the Buckeye Trail do it as day hikes. Uh, on our website, we actually have a group that, uh, hikes once a month on a weekend. They'll hike Saturday and Sunday. Uh, sometimes they'll, they'll publish where they are going to camp. So you're free to join them at the camp where they are camping or get lodging on your own. And these are typically car to car hikes. So everyone meets where they're going to finish the hike. And so you get 16 people show up. Uh, you then decide which four drivers are gonna drive to the start of the hike. So you, you pile into four cars, uh, you hike the 10 or so miles to back to your car, and then the people that drove will get a ride back to their car. This is a, a method of hiking so that you don't have to do an out and back. Otherwise, if you're on your own, you know, you're going to hike five miles out and five miles back, and then the next day start from that location if you're not backpacking. Which brings me to the fourth style, which is a through hike. Through hiking on the Buckeye Trail, I'll be honest, is a challenge. Uh, there's not convenient shelters or uh, campsites every 10 miles like a more developed trail. We're trying to fix that. We've been building uh, shelters. Of course, the biggest problem we have with that is finding land managers willing to allow us to build a shelter. Uh, also, we go through some urban areas where camping is kind of difficult to find. We do have uh, support. So if we know that somebody is through hiking the trail, the, they can reach out to the Buckeye Trail Association. We've got some trail angels that are willing to pick a hiker up, take him somewhere where he can spend the night and then bring him or her back to the trail. So if you're interested in a through hike, Captain Blue on the Blue Blazes is a book written by Andy Niekamp. Uh, he chronicles his 2011 solo hike he highlights people, places, present and past. Uh, this is a very wonderful book to read about the Buckeye Trail. He did a lot of research and provided a lot of 
information about the culture and the history. He writes about hospitality he did not expect. And he is the first solo through hiker of the Buckeye Trail. Uh, there was a solo hiker before him, but did not do the entire trail. He didn't do that section in Akron. So what's a good uh, trail without some uh, controversy? Chuck and Beth Hewitt wrote Wandering Ohio. Uh, this reads more like a, uh, uh, a hiking, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, kind of a diary. Uh, so they give a little more details about their hike. Uh, they said at their age, uh, they'd slept in tents long enough. And if they had an opportunity to sleep in bed, so they, were, they were going to take it. So on their hike, they spent 31 nights in tent camping. They had lightweight backpack tents. And they spent 44 nights in hotels, park lodges, cabins, and bed and breakfasts. We've got some events coming up, the winter hikes, uh, Finley State Park, which I mentioned, February 5th. Uh, one of my favorites is Baroque State Park on February 12th. Uh, we have our annual morel fest. If you like hunting for uh, morel mushrooms, that is at Tappan Lake, uh, April 30th to May 1st. We have the biggest day hike scheduled for June 6th. We are going to try to hike the entire Buckeye Trail in one day. We do this by breaking it up into sections or segments and having people to commit to hiking that segment that day. So if we get enough people, we can hike it individually, but collectively hike the entire trail. Last year we did this and we got about 87% of the trail covered. Uh, it was kind of hard to get people down in that Southeast portions. So June 6th, we're gonna, we're gonna shoot for 100% this time. We have the Emma Grandma Gatewood Solstice Hike Challenge, which is a 20, 40, 60, or 80 mile time challenge. You have 12, 24, 36, or 48 hours to complete that. I've done the 20, 40, 60, and I've finally finished the 80 mile on my fourth try. So uh, this year I'm gonna be doing the night 20 to, uh, I'm, I don't need to try the 80 again. The Little Loop Challenge was a precursor to the Big Loop, uh, the Big Day Hike. Uh, we, I, I knew I wanted to hike, to have an event hiking the entire trail in one day, but I knew that was going to be difficult. So I started with the Little Loop, and this year we'll have the fifth annual Little Loop Challenge, September 23rd, where we will hike the entire Little Loop in a day, and we celebrate with a barbecue in Stowe in the middle of the loop at, at the end. We also have Run for the Blue Blazes, uh, which is a marathon, half marathon, 10K, 5K. And I think uh, there's a, there was a 10 mile hike as well uh, that is in Shawnee, Ohio. And that's actually uh, put on by the Buckeye Trail Association. There's a lot of trail runs that actually are on at least portions of the Buckeye Trail, but this is the only one that is actually run by the Buckeye Trail Association. So if you're a runner, come on out. Our biggest event is the annual Buckeye Trail Fest. We get together and we move this around the state each year. Uh, it was canceled the last two years because of COVID. Uh, we're hoping to have it this year on September 15th and 17th at Camp Manitoc and Peninsula. It's three days of workshops, presentations, and hikes and some uh, speakers and some social opportunities. Some people come to these just to hike, especially if they're not from the area, they can discover parts of the trail. Uh, some people like myself come for the presentations. Uh, we have workshops on you know, kind of how to, and also uh, people that have hiked other hikes, not just the Buckeye Trail can uh, give a presentation on say like the, uh, the John Muir Trail, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that Buckeye Trail Association does is maintain and build trail. Uh, this year, our big push is to extend a backpack loop around uh, West Branch State Park. And we've got 33 days uh, scheduled this year. We've got a grant from uh, Athletic Brewery. They make a non-alcoholic beer. They're giving us $28,000, which we'll use to purchase materials, tools, uh, some of these work weeks are, we have three work weeks scheduled. We have a bunch of weekends scheduled and some work days also during the week. 
So there's nothing more rewarding to me than actually hiking on a trail that you help build. So we're trying to make this a backpack destination. Uh, if you're interested in, in joining us uh, to help build this trail bridges and you know cut trail through the woods, uh, welcome. Uh, look for our website for details of those dates. So um, we have a saying, get hiking, get dirty, get involved, get connected. And I hope that I've encouraged you to do just that. If you're interested in volunteering, uh, you can send an email to volunteer at buckeyetrail.org. Uh, we really depend on our volunteers. We'd love to have you. Uh, we depend on financial contributions as well. I should mention that. So our annual membership is about $40 a year. Uh, for an individual, uh, there's a family, you can get multiple years, you can get a life membership, there's a student memberships available too. Uh, you'll get a newsletter for that uh, the, and information. Uh, you'll also get discounts and on our website, on our store and our events. Um, so if you wanna donate financially, become a member, if you wanna volunteer, uh, reach out, volunteer at buckeyetrail.org. If you just want to come hike, uh, look up that uh, Lake Plains chapter and come hike with us. So that's it. And uh, with that, I would love to take your questions. I uh, know that I kind of went through that really quickly and I'm not sure what you were expecting or not, but uh, please uh, let me know what, you, what you're interested in. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Um, I'm going to give people a few seconds to come up with questions. Again, you can either put them in the chat box or uh, unmute yourself to ask a question out loud. Um, I did want to bring up there were a few chats while you were doing your program that Andy Vierhoff is here. He's with the Ohio History Connection, and he was really excited you're doing this program. Um, and also wanted to mention that the Ohio History Fund helped uh, fund some of those uh, markers for um, Emma Grandma Gatewood and uh, Eden Valley Enterprises. And he shared a link to one of the markers too. Um, so I'll be sharing a link to that marker in the chat box, but he did okay. a question for you as well. And sorry, Andy, I realize you could be asking this yourself, um, but he was wondering what carcinite is. Oh, it's um, just fiberglass. Yeah, that, that is an interesting term, but um, it's, it's fiberglass. Um, and we got another one in the chat. It said, as fracking has been burgeoning, especially in Southeast Ohio, how much of the trail is now impacted visually and perhaps in other ways? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that a little bit on personal experience. That, that wilderness loop section, uh, when I hiked a portion of that, there was actually a lot of active fracking going on. So there was, I saw a lot of signage for, you know, the whatever company it was, you know, either go this way or no blah, blah, blah traffic this way. And so there was some restrictions and some allowances. And one of the roads that I hiked uh, was a very large aggregate gravel. And I imagined it was beefed up because of the fracking that was going on. And I also imagined that before that, it was probably a nice, decent uh, country road at that time. So I think that kind of just despoiled at least that point. And that was a very good question. You know, and again, that's a road that maybe eventually, you know, with with effort and time, we can get off road. But um, that that one particular gravel road, and, you know, is a matter of uh, maybe four or five miles, perhaps. Uh, other than that, I didn't see too much. Uh, you might kind of go by those, but uh, there's definitely some impact. And, and that was, you know, when I hiked it, that section would, you know, back probably in 2015 or so. Uh, nothing else came in on the chat. Uh, if anyone else has a question, uh, please do feel free to unmute yourself. Um, um, Andy Vera, if you're, I had a question. Can I go ahead? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. I just didn't want to. Um, so, how do you? I don't know if this is an odd question or not, but how do you train for hiking the Buckeye Trail? Like for longer segments, is there is there things you should do to things you should do to train? 
Uh, I'm not thinking that's a thing. I'm just just asking. I don't know if I'm I'm the right person to ask for that because the funny story is I, um, well I don't want to make this too long, but I, I actually wound up hiking 100 miles in 48 hours. It it kind of evolved into a suicide awareness hike that I did on my own. It took me uh 10 days to recover from that which is unusual <laughs> for me and i i talked to a physical therapist and i said i hiked 100 miles in 48 hours should i what should i have done some stretching and he, he's like wait how 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 far and i said 100 miles he goes how long and i told him he said so what'd you do to train and i based on the looks on his face i should have done something called training um so like i've been walking all my life so i didn't think i needed to train uh, but to answer your question, I, I think seriously is just do a little bit at a time and, and know what your capabilities are. Um, you know, we had a chapter hike where we did 10 miles and I, uh, one of the women that joined us said she'd never hiked 10 miles before. The longest she'd done was six. She was worried about how long she, how, you know, whether she could do 10 and she's hiking the rest of the Buckeye trail now and, and she can you know, she should probably do easily 15 miles a day. Um, so it, it it's kind of just warm up to it. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Some of the areas in Southern Ohio are really very hilly. And if you're used to the flat area uh, around here, you know, it, it can be um, a little strenuous uh, if you're not used to it. And so, you know, it's hard to plan those hikes because you never know if 10 miles there is going to be easier. 10 miles is going to be extremely hard. Uh, I've had my friend that was hiking with me when I told him I, I hiked 10 miles, he didn't want to join me. And I said, well, if we do five, we can, you know, do car to car. So I don't have to, you know, and we did five and we were done in an hour and 45 minutes. And he was amazed at how quickly that took. And then uh, I said, you want to do seven next week? And, and I got him up to seven, I got him up to 10 and they couldn't get him past 10. So just, I would, I would say do a little bit at a time. Uh, if you're going to carry a backpack, you know, start working that in, uh, I recommend, uh, trekking poles. Um, you know, some people like them, some people don't, but I found I can go further and faster with less energy spent on a trekking pole, even if it's flat, but especially if it's uh, hilly. Uh, people that backpack, you know, just start out with a, you know, an overnighter uh, with maybe an area you're familiar with and, and low mileage and just work up and find out, find out where your limits are. You know, um, you might find that, you know, eight miles is a good comfort zone. You might find six, you might find 16. Uh, some people like to start when the sun comes up and hike until the sun goes down and, and just take take their time. I had a friend of mine who was hiking um, with Joan Young. Joan Young is uh, the first woman to finish the North Country Trail, and she's now doing it kind of as a quasi uh, through hike. She's actually in a travel trailer, and she's got she started in December. She's got 800 miles now. Uh, done and, and my friend hiked with her and was worried about you know how whether they would hike slow or not and when he found out that he slowed down he felt much better afterwards so it, it's kind of you know everybody's going to be different so his training is just do a little bit at a time find out what your distance is find out what how much weight you're comfortable carrying and how find out how fast or slow you need to travel or how fat how many breaks you need to take it's just something that um you know just finding out what your body is going to react to and what your body can do thank you thank you last call for questions I well i see one question about camping shortages uh, where did you spend most of your evenings where did you get picked up by your wife uh, so I did it mostly on weekends. I would um, sometimes leave after work and, and drive down, uh, especially Southern Ohio, uh, to get, you know, often setting up my tent, you know, right when the sun was going down. Uh, and then I had some friends that would join me on our hikes. So we would not backpack the trail, but we would camp at a campsite near the trail, either one of those uh, primitive campsites that are in the Wayne National Forest or at a uh, commercial campsite. 
and we would, you know, just camp there for the night. Then uh, on Saturday morning, we would meet and hike. Uh, it was kind of funny because we were in Chester Hill and you're close enough to the porches and someone asked, you know, uh, how far, how far have you gone? And we looked back at our cars and said about 300 feet. And he said, well, how far are you going? We told him 10 miles and he asked us where we were from. And that's when it really dawned on me because there were four of us and we were from Cincinnati, Dayton, Cleveland and uh, Columbus. And he said, so you guys just come together to hike. And I said, yeah, I guess we do. So after the hike, we would uh, drive, uh, to, if anybody needed to set up their tent, we would drive back to the campgrounds and set up our tent, then go get pizza. So that's the way I uh, hiked the trail. Uh, so most, of, most all the time I found some place to camp at a place uh, at least near the trail. <laughs> Interesting question. How many passed the Buckeye tree? I have no idea. <laughs> Any other questions? I, I will say one thing that the last picture on my uh, road walks was um, Ruth Duro. And I, I intentionally left that in there. When I give the longer presentation, I, I do tell people that uh, she and her husband uh, hiked the entire North Country Trail, and I drove to North Dakota for their completion hike. And they gave a presentation. And one thing she said is she actually liked the road walks because that's where you ran into people. On other long distance trails, uh, you might have other backpackers, but on the Buckeye Trail, it's rare that you see another hiker. And on the roads, uh, she got to meet people because you see this elderly couple with backpacks, uh, people get curious and want to know what they were doing. Uh, and she, so she actually enjoyed the road walks. Um, I had an experience where someone came running out of their house and asked me if I broke down and I, I said, no. And he said, uh, well, what are you doing out here? You know, it's not hunting season. You don't have a gun. And I told him I was hiking. He said, where are you going to hike? And I said, well, I'm hiking the Buckeye Trail. And he said, well, where's that? And then I pointed out the blaze on the telephone pole next to his driveway. And then he asked me if I needed a ride. And I, I said, no, I, I, I've got to walk this. I was doing an out and back. So I wish I would have thinking a little quicker because I could have got a ride away from my car. And he might have been mad when he saw me hiking back past his house three hours later. But um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to say the Ruth Duro said that uh, she actually enjoyed the road walks. Randall, I did get a comment in and then a, a question too, and then I'm getting some farewells as well. Uh, Matt Hins uh, shared that he works at CUVA and he's noticed a lot of people train for the trail between Brexville and Boston Mills because the train is rugged and people get used to the harder hikes there. So he wanted to share that with the group about uh, training. Yeah, the Cuyahoga Valley has got some good hills. They're, they're um, you know, the, as far as steepness goes, they go up and down. I mean, they're not very long. Um, you know, places I've hiked in in Pennsylvania have some very long uphills. Like when we're going uphill for six miles, you kind of go, whoa. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people use the Cuyahoga Valley to train, um, mostly for the AT. So it's it's a good place. And a lot of people do use the Buckeye Trail, at least portions of it, to, to train for the AT. And maybe for some novices in the room, what is what is the AT you're using? The, yes, the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> Thank you. That's the uh, one most quick, people know of. The one quick question, um, uh, do you have to pay a fee to get into state parks or national areas? No, there, there's no place along the Buckeye Trail that has a fee, uh, which is, uh, you know, we're, we're, the Cuyahoga Valley National Park is the only national park that is free. Uh, and you... People, we get questions from uh, hikers. Do you need a permit to hike the Buckeye Trail? And, and no, you do not need a permit. Uh, you do have to follow the rules of the park. So some parks might be closed at dusk or um, you know at 11 p.m. or something like that. And, and some of our nature preserves do not allow uh, pets. So you know some of the rules might change depending on where you are. Um, biking is... is um, okay on, on a lot of the trails. There, there's some trails where bikes are not permitted, but uh, a lot of places 
So a lot of people, instead of hiking the road sections, will bike the road sections. And, you know, it all depends on the trail that goes through the park, whether bikes are allowed or not. And some people will uh, ride their bike out, chain it to a tree and hike back to their car and, and they'll do, uh, they'll cover the trail that way uh, instead of doing, like I said, a car to car. You know, some people use Uber to, to get dropped off and then hike back to the car. It's kind of weird when you tell the Uber driver, this is where I went out. You know, there's nothing there, but you know, this is where I went out. All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I know at a live program, we'd all give you, be giving you a round of applause, uh, but just really appreciate you uh, volunteering your time here tonight to share this and uh, get people excited about getting out there and supporting the trail. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was very enjoyable. I look forward to seeing some feedback. All right. Take care, everyone. Stay warm. Bye. Okay.